Good morning. <laughs> can you hear me all right? Sorry for the technical difficulties. They will continue, but we'll power <laughs> through them. Um, I'm Scott Tinker, in from Austin, Texas. Stuart Brand is my co-panelist, and many of you know Stuart. I don't think he needs much introduction. The technical, technical difficulties are neither of us can actually click our own slides. So I'm going to be doing a lot of this. Uh, and, and we're a little behind the schedule, so I'm going to be doing a lot of this. But uh, let's get the next. This will be my signal, and stay right with me. So I have a framing conundrum. I think most of the people, and I've spoken in 50 countries around the world, don't know how gasoline is made or where electricity comes from. OK, and that's a conundrum. Um, so I got three concepts and three questions. Here are the three concepts. Uh, start here. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, my slides are all color coded. Green oil, red natural gas, gray is always coal. That orange color is nuclear. We used to say nuclear in Texas for eight years. <laughs> we say nuclear now. We call that bilingual, I think. But anyway, <laughs> hydro, yellow is renewables. Click, please. Let's go. Stay with me. All right, go. Um, so this is the world mix. 87% oil, gas, and coal still today. Fossil fuels. Uh, in North America, by the way, every color on the map is about a billion people. The colors on the continents are about a billion per color. OK. Seven and a half billion people in the Earth. Europe, you might think, would be a different mix, about the same as North America. A lot of hydro in South America, coal in Africa. The Middle East is no surprise, oil and gas. And finally, Southeast Asia. Half of the energy, not power, half the total energy comes from coal. I'm going to shrink and grow these proportional to global demand today. Go ahead. Go ahead. That's how the percentage that we're consuming. Half the people in the world live inside this circle today. Let me say that differently. Fewer than half the people in the world live outside of that circle today. They get half their energy from coal. Go ahead. The growth projections are Asia and Africa, largely growing. These could be wrong. They're just projections. Concept number two, the demand curve. We consume energy every day. We consume a lot during the day, and it goes down at night. This is eight days in the winter in Texas. Summer would be higher numbers. Go ahead. Here's our wind. We're the largest producer of wind in the nation. Unfortunately, the wind doesn't blow when we need it to. Okay, let me scale these now proportionally. Now they're equally scaled. Go ahead, and you can see that the wind, go ahead, the wind is blowing when we don't need much, so we have to backstop it. We backstop it, go ahead, click with natural gas. Energy storage would make a big difference here. But when the wind doesn't blow, we need a lot of backstop supply. Concept three, energy security. This drives energy behavior. There are four pillars. Is it affordable? Not just what does it cost, go ahead, but how volatile is the price? How much does it cost to build things? Is it available? Can we get to it? Is it reliable? Is it an intermittent source or not? And what about safe? Disasters and other kinds of things speak to reliability. Sustainability. Atmospheric emissions matter a lot. We know about climate change. So do local air emissions. But that's not the only thing in the environment. How much land does it use? How much water does it use? Land, air, and sea are all key environmental issues. There's not a single form of energy that meets all of these. Nothing is perfect. OK, go ahead. Keep going. So I got, we're going to move quick here now. We got three questions. Um, oh, by the way, I forgot to, Ben coached me, and I forgot to start. You have in front of you a clicker. There's a question. These are not them. The question you were supposed to be asked is, something about nuclear. Do you think nuclear will be a big part of our energy future? Should it be a big part of our energy future? Thank you. Should nuclear be a big part of our energy future? Yes, no, I don't know. And I don't can one, two, or three. And don't hit send. I'm getting coached in real time. Yes, no, three, don't click anything else. Just hit one, two, or three. Good. And we'll, we'll see the answers at the end. OK, let's go back to this. Wow, nice work up there switching. <laughs> Here's my three questions. Are oil, and are oil and gas running out? Is coal bad? And is switching to renewals simply a matter of political will? Let's go. Are oil and gas running out? Go. We're going to move through. This is the oil production in the United States. It looks like a mountain. Click. In fact. You hear a lot about peak oil, and this is the public. This is you having a nice day fishing. And all of a sudden, uh, 
Go ahead. Peak oil is a worrisome thing, potentially. Here's the real oil production in the world. This is by uh, OPEC, non-OPEC, former Soviet Union. Go ahead. Click. So OPEC looks like this. You've heard about the huge increase in o OPEC production. This is OPEC. It's kind of hard to see it, isn't it? There's been a lot of talk about increasing production. For this is Saudi in blue. They're really not up too much. Go ahead. But a lot of talk. Uh, and finally, split out the exact same data by geopolitical region. Go ahead. So in the early 70s, we were on a steep consumption trend. It's much more gradual now, but increasing 34 billion barrels a year of oil. It's hard to describe how much that is, give you a feel. A large ocean-going tanker that hauls oil, about 750,000 barrels, that's about 12 minutes of global supply, 24-7, 365. Go ahead. Go ahead. Where are we going to get it? Click. Everything to the left of the white line that we're about to draw is produced and consumed today. Everything to the right of the white line are potential resources that are available. They're more expensive. Deep water kinds of things go ahead from conventional. And then we have oil sands in Canada. And finally, we have these things called shales. Go ahead. Now, at $100 oil, a lot of these things are on the table. They're affordable to go after. Go ahead. If I drop that to 50 bucks, a lot of them go off the table. There's a real dynamic between supply and demand in the economy and energy pricing. Okay, go ahead. Click. Uh, so this is Ed Morris. Some of you may know him, good friend in New York, who said in 2010, where could shale go? It's going to go, he said, up to 4 million barrel a day, and I'm showing internal rate of returns from 45 to 70 bucks, more expensive. Click. Where is it actually gone? This was a very aggressive forecast at the time, by the way. It's already there. Shale's already exceeded Ed's projection. How about natural gas? Now you're ahead of me. Uh, good, though. Uh, I can catch up with you easy. Uh, it's on a different trend. I, and keep going. Where is it going to come from? No, you're good. Go ahead. Unlike oil, we're consuming more and more methane, 117 trillion cubic feet a year. That's a big number. Go ahead. To the left, produced and consumed. To the right, available resources. Do seem to be slow slides for some reason. Go ahead. At eight bucks, these are the unconventional. Eight dollar gas, a lot of these are being developed. All right, go ahead and click. If I drop that to four dollars, which we're about to do, um, <laughs> a lot of those go off the table. The best part of the best basins are still being developed successfully. That's why shale gas production continues to rise in this country, even though rigs are down by 80%, and shale oil is following that same trend. Go ahead. <coughs> Go ahead. So as a result, natural gas has climbed, and it, it production, keep clicking. I'm just going to stay up with you. We'll make this a movie. Um, and reserves are growing. This is the same kind of thing, a forecast uh, of shale gas. And click. This is Ken Medlock down at Rice, an economist and a good friend. He forecasts 15 trillion cubic feet a year from shale gas. Go ahead and click. Where is it actually today? It's there. Um, <laughs> It's, it's there, uh, 25 years ahead. It might not stay like that, and that's one of the big challenges. But the light pink, the light blue on top is the Marcellus. Okay, go ahead. Here's all the shale basins in the country. I'm drawing a big blob around them. Blob is a scientific term. Um, I'm going to blob a lot of energy, but these are the, if I left your shale, favorite shale off, that's fine. But I'm going to blob the big basins. Click. Uh, uh, geologist, here's where the here's what it looks like. Click. These are little teeny pores in these rocks. This is a, a SEM. We use all the medical technology in the world to look at rocks, including DNA. Go ahead. Hypothetical pore throat. Just click through this. Methane molecules of carbon and four hydrogens. Come with me now. Uh, this is going to scale this to the same. It almost goes away, but it doesn't quite. All right. These are teeny little pores. They're about 20 nanometers across. Click. Uh, a human hair, not really. I colored it to look like one. We're going to scale the pores to the human hair now. About 200 pores across the width of the human hair. That's why you have to frack it. Methane and, me and petroleum don't flow out of those little holes. You have to crack it to get to it. Go ahead. Uh, I'm, uh, just punch through this, okay? Don't have time. Just start clicking, and I'll track with you. You've got to do a lot of things, uh, and there are 
there are issues, just click away, okay? Prop and, uh, and I'll provide these slides on websites, different technologies um, for getting to prop and, the drill site has issues, you know, there's traffic, there's noise, there's light, there's dust. All oil and gas has those kind of issues. It's not necessarily just keen to fracking, keep going. Uh, the well pad itself, you produce water. On occasion, those ponds do leak at the surface, not often. I'm showing you all the possible things. They're pretty rare occurrences, actually. Uh, keep going. These are the different technologies that are being improved in each of these areas to make fracking and oil and gas itself even better. Keep going. And finally, the completion and production. A lot of things going on there. The challenge here is these figures always look like the fracking is just a few houses away from the surface. Every single figure and every single paper you'll ever read, that's why you don't know much about this. Okay, click. Uh, let's scale this figure actually to the right vertical scale. Go ahead. Now it's scaled correctly. And there are thousands of feet of rock between this, about 500 <laughs> feet in the surface. Go ahead and click. Here's some real data. Uh, this is the Barnett. You can do the, these are the frack zones. The fresh water is up there. Click away. Tallest building in the world, the Middle East, and Tom Cruise sitting on top of it. Uh, <laughs> Mission Impossible. Let's put Tommy up where he belongs on top at scale. And we're going to shrink the building now to the same as the fracking. In the shallowest part, you're still a hodge away of solid rock. You don't crack that rock to there. The, keep going. The other things I talked. Go ahead. The other things I talked about are real. They're not as bad as you think they are. Okay. They're being pretty well regulated and have been for a long time. But they're real. It's not perfect by any means. Keep going. You got to trade off the benefits and challenges against affordable, reliable, available energy, and a lot of things that that provides, including a healthy economy, which allows you to invest in the environment. Go to Greece right now and see how much money is being spent on the environment. Click. This is, this is, this is, don't, don't click. Don't click. You'll wreck my joke. This is fracking. <laughs> this is the frack truck headed off to the frack site, the public's perception, hauling frack fluids. And right behind the, about to hit the bridge, you see it's a little tall, go ahead and click. You know, here we are, the public, <laughs> you know. And, and I think many of us actually believe that. Go ahead. I'll be quick, Stuart, I'm almost done. Go, uh, it's coal bad. I'm just gonna pound through these blob, click. Stay with me, blobs, go ahead. A Lot of coal, 31% today instead of 28 today. Percentage is going up as the actuals climb tremendously. Why? It does all these bad things. Why would we burn more coal? Click. In an inner security sense, it's available, it's affordable, it's reliable. Three of the four tenets of secure energy, it's not sustainable in land, air, and sea sense. Okay. Click. Let's look at data. Fukushima. Remember pre-Fukushima? Coal, this was the mix of power generation fuels in Japan. What happened after that? Go ahead. They shut in all their nuclear. Would they replace it with not renewables, coal, natural gas, and oil to make electricity? Three years later, click. They just permit. They're just going to start up their first nuclear plant. We can talk about that. It's switching the renewables. My last question: Total energy consumed. Click. This is the mix in the U.S. Go ahead. This is the zoom in on the non-oil, gas, coal part, and non-nuclear. You can see it's mostly hydro and biofuels. The wind is up there on top in yellow, and solar above that. That's this piece here for how we currently satisfy our energy demands. Click. And, and we have built a tremendous amount of efficiency into our system. It's not talked about. But if we had grown at the pace of the economy a half a percent less, we would have been the red line. All of that wedge has come out of it through efficiencies in this country. It's a good story. can do better. It's still a good story. So the benefits of efficiency are obvious. Go ahead. The challenges of efficiency. Click with me. You got to, it's cultural. We don't think about energy. We think we know about it. We don't think about it. We use a tremendous amount that we don't have to. Go ahead. We had a little contest in Texas for efficiency. Um, <laughs> I wanted to be the ditto house, but we, go ahead, click, keep clicking, go ahead. So blobs, I'm going to blah, 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 hydro resources, these are all the dams in the U.S., just go ahead and punch as quickly as you can, all right, click, 
There they are, a blob. Keep going. Wind. I'm not, I'm highlighting the best resources. All resources are limited, and guess what? We develop the best ones first. It gets more challenging after that. Keep going. Solar. Just, just click away. I'll stay with you. Geothermal. You can see the blobs. And finally, nuclear. These are the, these are the plants in the U.S. Now click. I did this to Congress about a month, two months ago. Here's the shale. These are where the people live in the big red cities. There's coal, right on down, hydro, wind, solar, geothermal. And, and finally, if I, take so if I take geothermal away, because we're not developing too much of it, and I take the hydro away, because we aren't building many new dams, these are the major sources of energy oil, gas, coal, and wind today. Now, you can see it's not where people live. You have to move it. Now, go ahead. So what is where the people live? Click. Nuclear. OK. Keep clicking. This is the vote in the last presidential election. Uh, by county, I wanted to get a little more granular than just by state. Go ahead and click. There's where shale, coal, OK, go back. Here's where shale, coal, and wind are. Go back one, please. Shale, coal, shale, oil and gas, coal, fossil fuels, and wind. Mostly red. Keep going. Hydro, solar, and geothermal. Picking up blue. But we still miss a lot of blue. Go ahead. Don't tell anybody. OK. Click. Global investment in, in renewables has grown tremendously. Keep clicking with me. It's up to a quarter of a trillion dollars a year now. But interestingly enough, it, it was growing really fast percentage-wise, as things do when they are small. And we've danced around now a couple years down, a couple years up. Keep going. But still, $250 billion a year. Um, are we starting to peak in our investment? We'll see. Keep going. Here it is, parsed out by region. The developed nations, Europe and the U.S., have actually flattened. China is growing tremendously. Come on. I'll s come with me. Scale it. Keep going. And so as a result, the developed nations have largely plateaued, and the developing, go ahead, are growing tremendously um, in their investments. And they're about the same today, adding up to about $270 trillion, a billion dollars. Developed nations have been flattened their CO2 emissions. Developing went steeply up. Why? Right at the Kyoto Protocol. Maybe coincidental, but they didn't have to participate in it. So the curve of CO2 emissions, now we can go bad, bad China. Find something on your body that isn't made in China. Click. Uh, we demand their products. So it's not China's problem. This is a global problem. But we do have to get our, click up for me. We have to get our head around this. Developed nations produce the things for the world. OK, go ahead. So I didn't have any accurate numbers. I just made this one up. Statistical <laughs> studies show that that's useful. How many studies show that? 87 show that. Uh, go ahead. So I just made this up. But I actually pulled some pretty smart people. But it's not a scientific survey. It's just about 30 energy experts that I know. And you can see the moderate energy security and high or low by renewables. And then we made a film about this. And then go ahead and let's fill in with the other sources. Um, you know, available, affordable, reliable, natural gas and nuclear end up coming out pretty well on this, and we can have good discussion. Stuart's going to talk more. Power through this, my last example. This is the growth of electricity fuels in that part of the world where everybody lives. Most of it is projected to be coal. Go ahead. Even with a lot of gas and renewables coming in. So did we do this in the U.S.? Did we replace coal with gas? Click. Yes. It's, hap it's happening. Keep going. As a result, our CO2 emissions are already down. Mr. Obama's goals have been reached already by half. They didn't mention that. But we're already halfway there to 2005 levels. Go ahead. How about Europe? Did they do this? Click. No. Why? Moratory on fracking. Moratory on nuclear post-Fukushima. Doing what? Burning more coal. Germany's taking physical delivery of coal from the United States. They mix it with their lignite, and they make electricity to supplement their renewables. The CO2 equation of that little exercise isn't so great. Keep going. So here's the emissions from China. Huge growth. U.S. down more than any other nation on Earth, by the way. 
if you didn't know it, we are. Okay, go ahead. The cost of power as a result is eight cents a kilowatt hour in China, where they use a lot of coal and other things too, and very expensive in Germany. To say that renewables don't cost more so far violates reality. But as things get more in balance, it could happen. But the aggregate mix of things looks about like this. Keep going. And I worry. I'm a worrier. All right. I worry that we don't know which end of the chainsaw we're always pulling on. Um, so there's some consequences of political will that are very real. Go ahead. I'm actually glad you're going fast now. Uh, Energy consumed per person, energy per capita against GDP. A lot of nations, the US is up here. We consume the most energy per person. We make the most GDP. Click. China is down here in the lower left. World average, go ahead, is here. Click. Three billion people live there. Click. They want to do what we've done. Click. Why shouldn't they be able to? Go ahead. It'd be great if they didn't consume any energy. That's never happened. We're starting to see deficiencies. The US is flat in our GDP and our energy per capita. Go ahead. We think about really heady things in the developed nations, and we should. Okay? Climate change, balance of trade, all sorts of heady things. Half the people in the world live under this box. Click away. The other half the people in the world live under this box. They think about eating, housing, go ahead, clothing. Electricity be nice for 1.3 billion people on Earth. Any electricity. That's four United States with no electricity in the world. Click. They want to do what we've done. They want to grow and industrialize. So go ahead. They should be able to do that. Last slide. Governments, industry, and academics have to get together. We've got to work together. We can't hang out on our edges, happy to be getting all of our confirmational biases and believing what we already think. I call this... The radical middle. It's radical, click, because nobody's in it. <laughs> you know. It takes compromise. You have to admit you don't know everything. You're not right about everything. This is absolutely where we have to go. Go ahead. If we don't do it, we end up like these guys. They're putting in these posts to keep people from parking next to the building. So. I think they forgot where they parked. <laughs> and that happens when we don't come to the radical middle. I'm finished, go ahead. Uh, that's my jet now. I <laughs> go for it. <clears throat> I keep hearing, if you're an environmentalist, you can't be for GMOs, which we'll talk about tomorrow. Uh, you can't be messing around with genes generally, which we'll talk about with Jewish thinking tomorrow. And for sure, you can't be for nuclear power. But when I was 10 years old, I took the conservation pledge. I give my pledge as an American to save and faithfully to defend from waste the natural resources of my country, its air, soil, and minerals, its forests, waters, and wildlife. When I go like this, that means click. <laughs> so I went to Stanford. I majored in biology, specifically in ecology and evolution. Click again. I got out of Stanford in 1960. Sierra Club was just putting out their beautiful uh, big format photograph books that sort of pushed me farther into the environmental movement. And then the next thing you knew, uh, in 68, I was doing the whole Earth Catalog. And uh, <laughs> a little magazine called Coevolution Quarterly. Uh, we were the first to do the Gaia hypothesis. And then uh, we were uh, old up now. <laughs> All right. And then we got to, uh, we were close enough to the back to the land movement to make fun of it with our chrome. And I worked for Jerry Brown uh, and helped put California on the green course it is on now. California is, if it were a nation, uh, putting out the least uh, greenhouse gases of any nation in the world, except for one who's not even trying, which is France, because they're nuclear. Um, so we're very good, but we're not as good as we would be if we had lots of nuclear. Uh, then the whole book came out about how the whole Earth Catalog and Influenced the environmental movement by Andrew Kirk. And then I came out with this book, Whole Earth Discipline, uh, Why Dense Cities, Restored Wildlands, Nuclear Power, and Transgenic Crops Are Necessary. And then a film was made uh, by Robert Stone called Earth Days. And it was about the various people 
uh, who were involved in making the so-called modern environmental movement. I was there, Dennis Hayes was there, Paul Ehrlich was there, Stuart Udall is in the film. Uh, here's a still from that picture. I'm the, the guy who did the whole earth, uh, live on scene photograph, the whole earth, yes, button back in 1966. And then because of that film, in the response to it at Sundance, uh, Robert Stone did another film called Pandora's Promise. It was about five environmentalists who changed their mind about nuclear from anti to pro, mostly in context of climate change. And uh, it's a fabulous film. Films about people changing their mind are pretty rare anyway. This one's really well made. It showed at Sundance, premiered there, generally an anti-nuclear crowd. Uh, at the end of the premiere, people were coming up to us saying, how can we help nuclear? And this is people like Mark Linus, uh, one of the Cravens, Michael Schellenberg, who are serious environmentalists who had gone to Berkeley Road, gone pro-nuclear. Uh, here's a still from that. And one of the things I say in the film is, in light of climate change, how can you be an environmentalist and not be pro-nuclear in light of climate change? So here's just some of the slides I used to show when I was doing this a lot on the road. Uh, this is a much older diagram than the one you just saw from Scott. But basically, you see uh, pretty much wind and solar are not too consequential. Uh, here you see this is advancing itself. Don't do anything. Yeah, there you go, right? <laughs> And basically, you're seeing that coal is insanely wasteful and putting a lot of crap out there. And the amount of uh, waste that goes into <coughs> a lifetime of electricity from nuclear is the size of a Coke can. And if you look at that in context, a gigawatt year of electricity of nuclear versus coal, the waste from coal goes into everybody's atmosphere where you can't get it back except with great difficulty. Nuclear waste is local, controlled, monitorable, and easily taken care of, and very small. It's heavy, but it's small. A little bit about Chernobyl. One of the things my fellow environmentalists love to do is exaggerate all fears, but especially exaggerate fears about radiation. People who know radiation uh, do not have anything like the fears that imagine that somehow Chernobyl led to lots of Earth defects. Even Hiroshima and Nagasaki did not lead to any extreme extra birth effects in the following generations. It led to cancer, and that's where we got the linear no threshold diagram of how much to, uh, exposure to radiation leads to how much cancer later on, but no birth defects. So Huffington Post out to lunch. This is what the uh, Chernobyl Forum from the United Nations discovered. Not only no extra birth defects because of Chernobyl, on the order of 100,000 abortions because of Chernobyl, because of fear of radiation. And the cancers will be undetectable. It's too small to detect. The epidemiology cannot find extra cancers from the exposure, even in the 600,000 people most exposed, conjecturing there might be 4,000 people who could get cancer a little earlier than they otherwise would. That's it from Chernobyl, the worst uh, accident we've had. So. Uh, there's Chernobyl when it went off. Now let's look at Chernobyl now. It is the best wildlife refuge in all of Europe. <laughs> These guys, the wolves and everybody else, don't care. One of the biologists who worked there said, it's amazing, the exclusion zone, as soon as the people moved away and just stopped being people in that part of Ukraine, here came the wildlife. Animals hadn't been seen in forever. Some were brought in, like Przewalski's horse, extremely rare. And he made this comment, the world's worst nuclear power plant disaster is not as destructive to wildlife, it's just what people do all day, every day. So I think we will see Chernobyl National Park. When I first showed this slide five years ago, I'd get a you know, big chuckle, yeah, that'll be the day. On the other hand, if you go to Chernobyl now, uh, you can sign up for the tours. It's a major tourist attraction. They've got great ecological stuff to show. It is an important point in the history of technology of how you can really fuck up if you design <laughs> your power plants badly. Let it be a national park. Thank you. So this is the trend. And who pointed this out most is Jesse Austell. What you really want to do is have people stop burning coal or burning wood and dung in their houses, which is asphyxiating their kids. Many millions die a year just because of trying to cook with wood and and furthermore, they're cutting down the woods in order to do it. 
great, you move on to coal, thank you England, and it's still carbon, plus a lot of crap coming into the air, only it's everybody's air instead of just uh, inside the hut. You move on to methane, great, CH4, it's mostly hydrogen, less carbon. And then the trend to nuclear, where you got basically zero carbon, except there's a few side effects of you know, trucks that carry things and so on. The goal, and I completely agree with Bill Gates on this, is clean, cheap, abundant energy, especially in the developing world, because as Scott pointed out, that's where all the action is, frankly, in terms of greenhouse gases now and in the future. So the proliferation of nuclear power plants in the next generation, which we can talk about, don't melt down, way more efficient, can be built small and inexpensively. A bunch of different models being experimented with. You might go on to integral fast reactors and be able to use the waste that exists now as fuel for that generation of reactors. I think it's pragmatically the future, not just in terms of something that one might say, this ought to happen, but if we're, since we are taking climate pretty seriously and greenhouse gases pretty seriously, it will happen because we're trying all the stuff that doesn't work. And thank you, Japan and Germany, as we saw with Scott, for trying what happens when you turn off nuclear. What happens if you turn on brown coal or you turn on imports of fossil fuels? So we'll get to nuclear, and this group can help accelerate. Thank you. Stand up, say your name and affiliation, if any. Uh, very close. So I was wondering, where are we in terms of the storage of nuclear material? Um, safety and location and all of that? The main question is uh, actually movement of the fuel and uh, movement of the waste. And there's a wonderful uh, video I sometimes show of it. They, they did at Sandia Labs of uh, one of the nuclear fuel containers moving uh, in a truck, and then they run a train into it, bam! Uh, you know, obviously, they had a fleet of a time in the desert <coughs> in New Mexico, uh, and no bad thing happens to the, the container that's so well contained. We haven't had any, there's no end of, uh, of oil accidents happening lately. We haven't heard of any nuclear waste or fuel spill accidents, because this is very well taken care of. And one of the great things about it is that the just the sheer volume is so small, both of the fuel and of the waste compared to everything that goes out with fossil fuels. Except gas, the, the waste is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, the coal waste, as you saw, is, is horrible. One, one quick bit on that and switch. We went to lots of countries for nuclear. We filmed the two reactors in Texas, um, South Texas Project and, and uh, Comanche Peak. But we went to France and looked at La Hague, which is the largest reprocessing facility in the world. We don't do that here in the U.S., but they bring it from all over Europe. They bring the spent fuels, the depleted uranium, into La Hague. They re-enrich it, and about 95% of it goes back as fuel, enriched uranium. 5% is left, 4% fission products, 1% plutonium, which they have to manage and use as a fuel. The 4% fission products are vitrified and put into cylinders and stored in 30-foot thick concrete. Plus, you can see that in the film. Stuart's exactly right. They've been making, taking waste from all over Europe, and France itself has 53 or 4 reactors on that scale. It's in three rooms bigger than this, but you'll see they're not real big. And France has recently uh, permitted a geologic repository for nuclear waste, so they're actually going to take it and put it in the earth, and it's in shale. And, and there's reasons for that that we can talk about. In our country, Ernie Moniz, who's in Switch a lot, and he's a good friend, is now working toward thinking about, if not Yucca Mountain, where? And we're talking about deep boreholes that are quite boreholes. wide to go into the, and I'm a geologist, so sorry, but you're gonna go into the hard rocks, the old stuff. Two um, miles down, how far uh, down? A, a mile of stacked canisters and a mile of concrete on top of that and you have to be within 2,000, the basement has to be within 2,000 feet of the surface. So we're, they're in the process of, of um, awarding a prototype hole for that. So rather than 
uh, Yucca Mountain, which has some issues, not as many as people made out, but political ones. Yeah, they're, they're looking at that kind of thing to move and then permanently uh, store. Yeah, deep borehole is great if you decide you don't want to do anything with the waste in terms of turning into fuel. Another uh, major source of fuel is nuclear weapons. And so the program the U.S. has quietly had with Russia uh, for years is to convert their nuclear weapons into electricity uh, here. It's so it's kind of neat. The very same devices that were designed to blow up American cities are being used to just wipe up American cities. Um, I would like to see that done with all the nuclear weapons in the world. There's a lot of good juice in there. We can turn it into electricity for everybody. And that will be, I think, a point of where we could say, okay, civilization has sorted nuclear out. There are no more weapons, and there's a lot of good, clean nuclear energy. Question? In the back, and then we'll come up front. Is Kiwani being shut down, and should it be? I'm sorry, which? Kiwani. Yeah. Which one is Kiwani? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. It's a part. It's a nuclear plant in Wisconsin. Yeah. And there are other examples. Why, right. no. Yeah, there's the one in Vermont. That's right. Um, when these things are shut down before they've actually exceeded their uh, their real use value terms of the design and the materials and so on, typically it's because of the way the regulations uh, make it uneconomic for nuclear plants and extra economic for uh, renewables, wind and solar. I have to say that I would add to what Scott has said about wind particularly is that wind farms uh, are kind of fun and great when the first time you see them, but they industrialize the landscape in a way that is uh, deleterious to wildlife and recovery of all sorts. Uh, the solar farms in the countryside, like in Ivanpah in California, have a similar terrible effect on wildlife. Um, so I think solar farms should be on mineral deserts, like Gobi or Sahara. There is one in the Gobi. And uh, wind farms, I guess they're a little better at sea, but we aren't doing that. Uh, England is. It's still uneconomic. I'd like to see uh, lots of solar you know, right where it's needed on rooftops and so on. And uh, wind where it's not so disruptive to the natural landscape. Bill Gates said there's energy farms and energy factories. Energy factories are coal, gas, and nuclear. Very compressed, very small footprint, very um, low effect on the natural environment. And the energy farms are solar, wind, and uh, biofuels, and hydro. They use very dilute sources, so they have to be a big footprint to collect enough energy to make any difference. So I like the factories. We'll come up front. <coughs> it's my sense, and I don't know if I'm. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's my. What's your name? Is it on? Yeah, it's on. It's my sense, uh, and I don't know if I'm correct about this, that uh, uh, across the country, nuclear plants are being shut and not replaced, that there's no political will to replace them, and therefore there's no, uh, the financial community is not willing to invest. Am I correct in that? And if I'm not correct in that, or even if I am, uh, would you care to comment on it? I think that where the investment may come, and you're starting to see it um, by enthusiasts like Bill Gates, who's got his own nuclear design underway for TerraPower uh, is in next generation stuff. So you're seeing a passing of the older generation, sort of the Rickover uh, light water reactor experts who've been done a fabulous job. Uh, they are gradually aging out of uh, you know, going into retirement. Then there was, because we stopped building them, talking about just the US now, we stopped building them and then uh, there wasn't people, new engineers coming up. So you're getting a younger generation of nuclear engineers now, uh, young men and women, who are not wearing the narrow red ties of the older <coughs> generation. Uh, they feel like the future is theirs, and they're, I think they're right about that. So there's gonna be, I think, a kind of excitement building, uh, both at the level of people getting involved in this as investors, as designers, 
and as uh, engineers making it actually happen. So far, we just talked about the US. China is barreling ahead. And when Bill Gates wants to try out a version of his TerraPower device, uh, he just said, I can't, you know, I'm, it's too complicated to do it in the US, I'll do it in China. And this is happening with a lot of advanced technology. They'll try it in China first, make the case, and then gradually it'll be adopted here, and then even more gradually in Europe. I'll add on to that. 29 new reactors are being constructed in China today, physically constructed. Uh, Saudi Arabia is looking at them. There's one just finished in the Middle East in Dubai, a nuclear reactor. They're right. looking beyond. <laughs> India, of course, is heavy, and they're looking at other fuels. So I think one of the great challenges, we have five permitted in the US now on brown fields. That they've kind of come in quietly. We'll see if they get built. To your question of will a CEO take a risk in the US, it's pretty hard for them to do that. You look out at that future, and if in 10 years they get down that road and then it's challenged and killed by a variety of means, which can happen here as opposed to China, then that is a very risky investment for them to make. So we're falling behind globally. We are falling behind globally. Yes, we are. In, in terms of construction, I don't think we're falling behind in terms of design. Correct. Yeah. We're still the largest producer of electrons from nuclear in the world. We have 102 reactors, 101 reactors now. But it, the rest of the world is going, is heading that direction. With a damn good safety record. We have a chat recently where he was standing up and debating about the uh, tragedy caused in the earthquake in the DFW at the airport where sure. one this summer where two point one eight came off of the ground. My organization, I led it through the Texas Ledge, which is a really simple thing to do in the Texas legislature, trust me. Uh, not. But uh, we just got uh, almost $5 million. We're going to put 22 new seismometers around Texas, permanent and 36 portable ones. And we are going to work with industry, government, and academics, my radical middle, to increase our ability to monitor seismicity, all seismicity. Um, it's not the fracking. Let's be real clear. The fracking itself, I showed you how deep that happens. When you produce those fluids and dispose them, large volumes over long periods of time at low pressures, but large rates. If you're near a natural fault in the earth, you can accelerate the movement of that by changing the pore pressure. And that happens now and then. It's happening, two just happened yesterday in Oklahoma, two more near Oklahoma City, just north. So yes, uh, man can induce seismicity. We have 7,500 disposal wells in Texas, about seven. Five to ten have been potentially related to this. So keep the perspective you know, scales in mind. Ten out of seventy-five hundred, but it still can do better. We can always do better. This is a point that Carl Pope, the former head of Sierra Club, makes that um, you, you look at oil and gas per individual excavation, per individual hole. So a few holes are troubling. You look at those and regulate those and deal with those, but if most of them are fine, that's great. Go ahead and get the gas going. The same thing with oil. And so rather than doing these kind of category level, oh, fracking is bad because these 10 wells seem to have problems, that's not a useful way to move ahead <coughs> with policy. I used to be in the communication business, so my question is related to that. Um, we know that uh, government action comes from bottoms up usually, they don't lead. <laughs> so what are you folks doing to educate, uh, which is a, obviously a very serious, difficult challenge that will require enormous amounts of money, uh, but sounds like an imperative task. So who's going to do that and how can you motivate people to do that? I'll start. Um, so I give talks a lot. I'll, I'll be speaking to in Oregon next week, spoke three times in last week and blah, blah, blah. But you only get to hundreds at a time. Um, after seeing some films come out, we made Switch. It's just past 10 million viewers. It's in 700 universities now. It's been called the most objective film on energy made. Steve Coonan is featured in it quite a bit, um, as he should be. And we're trying to get into the media that way and give uh, educators of all kinds tools to use. Most people at the end of Seeing Switch said, why haven't I heard this before? What I hear is this, this, and this. And nothing's perfect, but so the film media helps. Um, and then you gotta start working with challenging a few of the things that are way out on the fringes. 
that are very popular and get in the press a lot because they're dramatic. But Stuart described it extremely well, and I truly appreciate knowing where his life has come from, his perspectives on that drama. Let's, the drama is destructive. It, 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 it kills good conversations around which we've got to focus and find compromise solutions. Nothing's perfect. So I think if the more of us that can run to the radical middle and make sure the fringe <coughs> voices are kept where they should be, I think the more likely we are to move forward with, with, with logical portfolios of things that, that will matter to our future. For Nuclear Eagles, uh, this film, Pandora's Promise, um, it's a pretty chilling film. It's so well made and it's so persuasive that uh, it's used in you know, conferences and colleges and so on a lot. Uh, it was on uh, CNN or something a while ago. That, yeah, it's uh, one very persuasive thing. It got no money from the nuclear industry, so you can put that aside. And I am not a shill for the nuclear industry, trust me. Uh, there is no nuclear industry that is such, you know, that is, you know, that the NEI, the Nuclear Energy Institute, or whoever it is, that does a bit of lobbying. But uh, basically, the, at least in the U.S., nuclear is owned by uh, various power heavyweights who most of their juice comes from other things, and nuclear is one of the things they do on the side, and they're sort of you know, quiet about it. And they got paralyzed a while back of, of trying to educate people about it. Um, Understandably. <laughs> so it's actually basically up to the people saying, okay, um, there are now good sources of good data on all of this stuff. We don't have to listen to the extremists. And uh, we can encourage our uh, legislators to move ahead in the various ways that need to be moved ahead. And mainly, frankly, uh, find ways to help India, China uh, get off of coal, leave the coal in the ground. I think a carbon tax, frankly, would be just great. And it is the case that you can't, the problem is nuclear is kind of expensive compared to coal. Coal is so incredibly cheap. So we can go the cheap way and cook the atmosphere. How do you make coal expensive? And the only thing that can do that is nations. Nonprofits can't do it, businesses can't do it, nations can do it. They can say, you know, uh, coal is so harmful to us and to everybody, we're going to leave it in the ground, we're going to do it by taxing it or whatever, uh, then you're ahead of the game. So making that happen, these are political issues at the national level currently. Even though climate change is a global event, and cities are moving ahead very rapidly in, in responding to climate change, uh, this is an, a place where nations really, really can step up and make the difference. Just so we don't violently agree on everything mm -hmm. up here, which so far we have pretty much just uh, devil's advocate mm. a little bit on that. It depends on what your objective function is. So if you go to the extreme end member, let's just say it's the human condition it only and not nature. Let's put those on, and they're not that way, but let's put them on end. Then it's hard to go into communities in China and India and, and parts of South Africa who are trying to lift themselves out of poverty and say, and I chaired a World Bank panel on this and had three of those nations say to me, you can't lift yourselves out of poverty because your resource is coal. That's what you have access right. to. You use what you have where you have it. It's hard to move energy. So we've got to do this in a way that recognizes the human condition, which is included in the effects of climate change, but also <laughs> having access to available, affordable, reliable energy. And, and that has to be balanced. It's not an easy equation, but I think it'd be easier to do it in nations that can afford it. The best thing for the environment is for everybody in the world to get the hell out of poverty. They're working as fast as they can at that. Uh, they are doing it mainly in cities. Cities need base load electricity. Uh, if they can only get it from coal for a while, that is okay, net net. Uh, what you want is to be able to convert over time to something that does not produce greenhouse gases and does produce yep. abundant, cheap, clean energy. We'll keep going. If somebody who's organized. How's our time? I have a quick question about the elephant in the room. It may be in the other room, but it's uh, dealing with the price of oil and gas and liquefied natural gas, the capacity of liquefied natural gas, and the Mideast. Right. Take it from there. Yeah. 
So the price of commodities is a, is a response to, in its simplest form, supply and demand, and then a lot of other things on top of that. Um, it's a very volatile priced set of commodities, oil and natural gas. They're quite low today. As a result, the oil and gas industry is having massive layoffs. And everybody might say, yay, but, but careful with your yay. Mm -hmm. Because some countries actually have state oil and gas companies that are happy to fill those gaps, just like it's happened in nuclear. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that are going to develop the world. And they don't do it with SEC regulations and the environmental sensitivities that the big major traded companies do. And there aren't many of those left. So price volatility introduces a whole lot of uncertainty. Shale is an interesting thing. Again, I know I'm in the Northeast, you know, and I do, I have, did I wear the flak jacket with bulletproof? I got my bulletproof vest on, good. Uh, but, you know, if you think about shale for just a second, I didn't show a global map. It's the most common sedimentary rock in the world. It's the source rock. It means it cooks and releases hydrocarbons that go into, get trapped in conventional reservoirs. It's the kitchen. It's found in lots of places where conventional oil and gas are not. It spreads the control of those two sources of energy across the world geographically and geopolitically. There's, I have maps and longer talks. The most resistance to production of shale, the funding if you chase it, is coming from where? Russia. Russia for natural gas and, and the Middle East for oil. They are underpinning resistance. It's not that they don't have any. They have tremendous conventional gas. They have tremendous source rocks. They want to sell the cheap stuff first to the world and then go to the more expensive stuff. Let's delay it. It's just business. So energy is never what it seems. You've got to read deep into the issues to understand who's underpinning and funding some of the things we're hearing, including films. Okay. So I like to spread personally in transition of the geopolitics of oil and gas to put it more as a, as a, as a physical global commodity. I hope that helps. I'll bet our time is up. Is our time up? We got to stop. No. We got to vote again on the nuclear oh. question. So there's a post session, same question, right? Uh, I'll now, this audience not that different. Vote again, one, two, or three. Don't hit send. Quick, 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 quick. Vote early, vote often. Yeah, I thought so. So 72 to 89. What I like best is the don't know went down. Thank you.